I'd like to invite you this morning to turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Do you like the book of Revelation? It's our book. We're living in the end time of earth's history, and the focus of that book is the day in which we live. And so I'd like to uh, have you turn with me to verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. That's uh, the burden of this text is repentance for the Ephesus church. The Ephesus church was the first church of the seven, right? In Revelation two and three. And then the last church, if we turn over the page to Revelation 3 and verse 19. Revelation 3, verse 19. This is the last church now, the seventh and last one. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and what? Repent. Repent. So, that's Laodicea, the last, final generation church. That's us. It says repent, right? Ephesus lost their first love. Laodicea has lost its need for Christ. Revelation 3, verse 17. Let's look at that verse 17. It says, Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Have need of nothing. Laodicea lost that love for Jesus. And then the true witness, Jesus says, repent. Repentance has not been a popular teaching. But the Bible often mentions repentance as an absolute necessity. Today, I want to explore that vital Bible teaching with you. If you could turn with me to Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Acts 17, 30 and 31. <clears throat> if you're there, say amen. amen. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to what? Amen. Repent. Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, capital M, whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance to all men in that he has raised up him from the dead. Here repentance is associated with the judgment. There's a day that God has appointed in which he will do what? Judge the world. Laodicea means judging of the people or the people who are judged. That's what the word Laodicea means. That's us, right? Revelation 14, 6 and 7, that's the message that Laodicea gives. And that message has in it, the hour of his judgment is what? Come. Coming? No. The hour of judgment. When this message goes forth, and we believe that message is going forth to all the world this morning. And when that message goes forth, uh, the judgment has begun. And in view of the judgment, all people everywhere need to repent. That's what it says in Acts 17. Why all men? Because all men are sinners. Romans 3.23 says, there is none righteous, no, not what? One. No, not one. And Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And uh, in the present continuous tense that's find, found in originally, uh, all men have sinned and continue to come short of the glory of God. James 3.2 says, in many things we all offend. And uh, there's an imperative in that. In all things, in many things we all offend every day. Sometimes I have to ask myself at the end of the day, who did I offend today? Acts 3.19 to 21 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, 
that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And then he says, and then he shall send, send Jesus, second coming. And uh, so <clears throat> restoration of all things is, in verse, is the next verse. So sin is a horrendous rebellion against God and his law. In fact, Romans 8, 7 says the carnal mind, the mind that we're all born with, is enmity against God's law. Enmity against God's law and, and against him. The presence of sin, conscious or unconscious, calls forth the righteous judgment of God. This is not a judgment or a justice that God meets out with capriciousness. He doesn't do this with anger. He does not do this with, with a vindictiveness. But it's called in Romans chapter 2, the righteous judgment of God. It's the righteous judgment of God that destroys the sin problem. And that's what de demands repentance on the part of every believer. Spirit of Prophecy says that with every advanced step, our repentance will what? You know that verse, don't you? With every advanced step, our repentance will <clears throat> deepen. Deepen with every advanced step. I need that today, I needed it yesterday, and I need it tomorrow also. So justice, a word from the law courts, demands a righteousness that is consistent with the broadest claims of God's law. As sinners, we don't have that to give. So our approach must be to allow God to give us a repentant heart. That's the solution, a repentant heart. Do you know what? We're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, aren't we? If our heart is right with him today, we would be ready if he would come today, right? Now, he won't come today because there's some things that the Bible says have to happen. But if my heart is right with him, a repentant heart, <clears throat> I would be ready if he came today. Can, can we all agree this morning that, that we could be ready for him to come? Yes. He asks for repentance heart. And in your scripture reading, you notice that it's the Holy Spirit that gives repentance as a gift. God's solution to the problem in view of the cross of Calvary is repentant heart. The combination of justice and mercy are the twin pillars that stand on the platform of love. The combination of both, justice and mercy, is what a word that we call the gospel. That's good news. Do you think Laodicea needs good news? I'm living in Laodicea. And I have to tell you, Laodicea needs good news. Jesus provided both at the cross. The penalty that he paid was the justice of God. And the mercy, the forgiveness, all of this was sacrificed when Jesus died on the cross. He took both. So how do we approach such love? I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. How do we approach such love? Mark chapter 1, verse 15. You all know this in my heart. <clears throat> I want to read 14 and 15 together to get the context. And after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Then what does it say next? Amen. Repent you and believe the gospel. That's how we approach such love. Allowing the Holy Spirit to give us a repentant what? Heart and mind. We should repent because it's God's will. Sometimes we pray, Lord, your will be done. The highest will of God is that we repent and have a, have a, have a connection with him every day, right? He commands it. But someone says, how? I don't really know what that is. Someone says, well, repentance, well, repentance is sorrow for sin. 
That's the standard answer that I hear. Yes, but that's, that's really the fruit of repentance. We're talking about a different thing here. We're talking about something else than that. Esau was sorry, too. But who was he sorry for? Himself. He was sorry for Esau. He made a sinful, selfish decision, and sin was the con has consequences. Another person says, well, repentance is a reformed life. But I have to say, that's the fruit of repentance. When we see, a, when we see fruit, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's the fruit of something else, right? Why do I say these things? Some men came to John the Baptist one day. It's recorded in uh, Matthew, the third chapter. Matthew 3, verse 8. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. <clears throat> and... Uh, they were among the Pharisees and Sadducees. And uh, Jesus said, or John said, I'm sorry, O generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Here these guys come. They're very pious. They don't have repentant hearts. And then he says, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. So there are fruits to repentance, aren't there? No repentance is genuine unless it brings forth fruit. If it doesn't have a root, it won't bring forth fruit. You ever heard of a tree that doesn't have a root and it brings forth fruit? Sorrow for sin and a reformed life. That's the fruit of repentance. Someone has said repentance means more than... means. <laughs> someone has said, in the church I just came from, there was a, a lady in the church, a very elderly lady. She said, repentance means sorry enough to quit. <laughs> Still remember that. Every repentant sinner will be a reformer in his own situation. Every repentant sinner will be a reformer in his own situation. And when one, when one repents, he or she is sorry for sins, grieved to the heart. When a people really, and I, I want to emphasize the word heart. Repentance is a thing of the what? The heart. A reformed life is the fruit of repentance. When a person really repents, he turns around and goes the other way. He doesn't continue to grieve God by blaming God and consciously obeying God. <clears throat> Godly sorrow floods his mind and his heart. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to do this, he will bring repentance to us as evidenced by a reformed life. <clears throat> I'd like to have you turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You're all familiar with this one, I think. It's before Thessalonians. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. He says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, <clears throat> but that you sorry to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner. They were made sorry. This is not something that's self-generated, is it? In Acts chapter 5, it says that it is a gift of God. It says, you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance. It brings fruit, in other words. Repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. That's what a reformed life looks like. Well, let's look a little farther as to what a reformed life looks like. Uh, if it's fruit, this is what it'll produce. It's in the book of Zechariah, right near the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah. Chapter 12. 
Zechariah chapter 12. Are you there yet? 10 to 14. Here's what a repentant heart looks like. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's the church, the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him. Who's the him here? Jesus. They shall mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, in the church, as the mourning of Haddon Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart and the family, and, and, and the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart and the family of the house and Nathan apart, and their wives apart. How many people are included in this? Everybody, everybody. The family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, and the family of Shimei apart, and their lives apart. All the families that remain, and every family apart. (laughs) And chapter 13 and verse 1. This is going to lead to something. Verse 1 says, in that day, what day is that? That's the day of Laodicea. In that day shall a fountain be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for all sin and uncleanness. I want to tell you that this, this fountain for all, for all sin and uncleanness is the repentant heart. We've not seen repentance consistent with this scene yet. We haven't seen it yet. An old-fashioned camp meeting. A distinguished doctor of divinity preached on repentance in a very scholarly way. He had a lot of fancy words, in other words, okay? And when he was finished, people didn't know what, what, they didn't know if they had repented of anything. In the back of the room at the same camp meeting, there was an old preacher known known all over the state. He was not as eloquent as the doctor. And his grammatical mistakes were many. But God had seen fit to use him. And when the doctor had finished his celebrated sermon on repentance, this old preacher rose from his seat and asked, you know what, if you'll allow me, in a very loud voice, if you'll allow me to say some words about repentance, it will take only five minutes And a chorus of of voices cried out, go ahead. And with the aid of a cane, the old preacher walked down the aisle. And he said, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. And then when he got two thirds of the way down the congregation, he turned around and he said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. What an idea. What an idea. I woke some people up, right? Well, he did that day too. All around people began to stand up so they could see him as he walked down the aisle. And uh, then he went back up to the pulpit and said, this, that is repentance. A changed heart. That's what he said. That's what repentance is. It's a changed heart. Do we need a changed heart? Ask yourself. We should examine ourselves and see if we're in the faith, right? Luke 13, verse 5 says, Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. So how important is this idea? That change of heart is what the Bible calls repentance. Repentance. It's the res- and the result is fruit, the fruit of a changed life, a changed mind that doesn't want to be destroyed anymore, but wants to go to heaven. It's a thing of the heart, evidenced by reformed life. Repentance is produced by 
The Holy Spirit, as the gospel is heard and listened to, when you hear the story of salvation, like the song that we just heard here, and the one before it, victory in Jesus, that's the gospel. When you hear a message like that, it's not just a song that we sing. It's a conviction of what our sins have caused the Savior, and we have victory in Jesus, and that's repentance. Repentance is the gift of God. Genesis 3.15, that very first promise of the Savior, what does it say? It says that the, that the gospel will put an enmity in our heart against sin. A hatred for sin develops. That's, that's, that's what a reformed life looks like, a hatred for sin. The gospel is preached and the Holy Spirit brings repentance to every willing heart. But there's an important word in there. Now, some of us might say, well, I'm not quite willing yet. If you don't have a willing heart, then pray for a willing heart. Why should we repent and not delay this work of God in our hearts? Because the most common manifestation of, of sin against the Holy Spirit is persistently, persistently refusing to repent. The Bible has something to say about grieving the Holy Spirit. Persistently refusing to repent. Where does repentance come from? The bidding of the Holy Spirit to our hearts, right? John 16, verse 8. The margin says, the Holy Spirit convinces us, convert, converts, convicts of sin, convinces us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When we refuse these plain providences of the gospel, the pleadings of the Holy Spirit, we find no pardon. And worse, we silence the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We all experience that voice, don't we? And finally, we'll lose all desire to be reconciled to God. And the judgment hour gives great urgency to respond to the gospel. The response will result in a changed heart and mind. It's a miracle of the grace that is transmitted to us by the work of the Holy Spirit in our minds. God promises forgiveness to every repentant sinner. But he's never promised tomorrow for procrastination. This cannot be safely postponed. We're living in the hour of God's judgment. Remember, judgment and repentance are in the same verse in Acts 17. If you'd like to have a repentant heart, please, I beg you, come to God. Psalm 32, verses 3 to 5. Psalms 32, verses 3 to 5. I'd have liked to have heard John Whitfield preach. <laughs> he preached in the 1700s. He drew big crowds. You know, this is what he talked about. John Whitfield. And the Wesleys came along later. There was a great revival in the late 1700s that resulted in a, in a lot of good things. Actually, the Advent movement came on the heels of that revival. People looking for Jesus to come. Revival? That causes people to look for Jesus, right? That's what the, that's what the Bible promises. Acts 3.19 to 21 says, Repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and he will send Jesus who will restore all things in verse 21. So repentance is a call, a call out to God, even so come Lord Jesus. <clears throat> the judgment hour gives us an urgency to repentance. More than the first century or the second century or the third century, the final generation, the judgment hour, gives an urgency that was never before seen in the Christian era to have a repentant heart. God promises forgiveness. He has never promised tomorrow for procrastination. This cannot safely be postponed. If you have a repentant heart, please, I beg you, let's look at Psalms 32. Psalms chapter 32 and verses 3 to 5. Here's what it says. 
When I keep so kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I've had that. I've experienced that. Have you had experienced the heaviness of God's hand on you? Yes, I've ex we've all experienced that. My moisture turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity have I not hidden. I, I said, I will confess my, confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of sin. David isn't the only one that needed a repentant heart. And if you read the Psalm 51st Psalm, you'll find out what a repentant heart looks like. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, he said in Psalm 51. Now verses 9 to 11. Be you not like as a horse or a mule. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, a mule is the offspring of a donkey, right? <laughs> I have some donkeys. I'll tell you what. We don't want a heart like that. If you try to load them at the first time, they'll sit down on their back, on their back end and they'll put their two feet right out in front of them and they won't do a thing. You can coax them with a carrot or whatever you want to do and if they've made up their mind, you can't get them to move. So he says here, be not as the horse or as the mule which has no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a, with a bit and bridle, thus lest they come near to you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusts to the Lord, mercy shall come past him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you that have an upright heart. Isn't that neat? That's a neat psalm. Maybe it's worthy of even memorizing. You know what? This is not a weak, sick, sissy idea. I don't like that word sissy, but I, I've heard it a few times. This is not a weak, sissy idea. This is David, the mighty man of valor, who has a repentant heart toward God. It's for men and women, both, and children. The Bible records one eleventh hour conversion with a repentant heart. And who is that? The thief on the cross, right? But that's the only one I know of in the Bible. There may be others, but I haven't run across it yet. A deathbed experience of repentance. Why? Because God doesn't want us to presume on his goodness. We're talking about presumption here. Without a repentant heart, we're presuming on his goodness. We're just talking about it, not making any decisions. God doesn't want us to wait until we're dying. We may not get that chance that the thief had. Yeah, the thief's conversion is good news, but we might not have that, that uh, wonderful idea. Now is the day of salvation. Here is the ABC. ABC. A, acquaint now thyself with him. That's the first step. How do we do that? Spend some quality time every day searching the word for the purpose of knowing him. Acquaint now, that's the A, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace with, and be, and be at peace, and thereby good shall come upon you. That's a quote from Job twenty-two twenty-one. The B, that's the A. Acquaint yourself with him. The B is, behold, now is the accepted time. Don't wait on this thing. That's presumption. If we claim to be Christians, it's presumption to wait. We don't want to do that. That's found in 2 Corinthians 6.2. And the C, the A is what? Acquaint yourself with him. Spend some time every day learning from him, learning of him, learning to know him. B, behold, now is the acceptable time. Now the C, come now. Let us reason with the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, that's Isaiah 1.18. They shall be as what? Wool. If we put behind human reasoning, God will reason with our spirit. And we shall see the cross of Christ, and it'll break our hearts. That's the kind of experience that will bear fruit. That's the only experience that will bear fruit. Repentance is a thing of the heart. 
The reformed life is the fruit, remember? We need a repentant heart. A drunk man may see two candles in the night when only there's one. He sees two of them. And uh, he's seeing double. If he blows out the wrong one, what happens? He's in darkness. Darkness comes and covers the room. Many today are staggering with drunkenness, of false teachings, playing with sin, putting off the day of salvation. Don't do that. Don't leave the place this morning, this little chapel, without saying, yes, Lord. Don't wait for a more convenient time. There's not a more convenient time than this very morning. And it's morning has passed. You know what it is? It's five after, five after now. And I got about three more minutes till after four. We can't live two lives. One life for ourselves and one life in which we turn to God on the Sabbath day. So foolishly, he blows out the only candle he has. And in the terrible darkness, he lies down forever. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, true repentance affects four different things. It affects the eye. It affects the ear. It affects the hand. It affects the feet. Like Zacchaeus, the eye, he saw that he was a sinner. The ear, he heard the message of salvation. The hand, he took hold of Christ by the hand of faith. And the foot, he grasps joyfully in the path of obedience, walks the life of obedience. That's the fruit of repentance. This may uh, involve some restitution. I might have to go to somebody that I offended today and say what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's very difficult sometimes to say I'm sorry. It may involve giving up a pet sin that has, has been cultivated and cherished secretly maybe even for many years. It may involve that. It may be seriously to deal with pride or anger or envy or covetousness or jealousy in the Bible way. There may be a list as long as your arm, but Jesus understands. He's been here. He was born in our flesh. And he's as tempted as we are, yet without sin. And he knows all about your situation, whatever it may be. Salvation is a miracle, a new creation. Finally, we repent because he has not made us robots. He has made us free moral agents. We have the ability to change our attitude toward God. And uh, the Bible says we're not like a mule or a horse. We need to make decisions about where we spend eternity. God has given us a clear path. It's the pathway to the throne. Look at that final generation. Revelation 14, verse 1. This is my last text, and then we'll sing our closing song. Revelation 14, verse 1. This is what God is looking for. Revelation 14, verse 1. These are our repentant people, and the message they give is the message of three angels. I looked, and behold, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having the Father's name written where? In their foreheads. Hymn number 569. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Let's look at these words and give our hearts to Jesus anew this morning. A new commitment, a fresh start as we leave these halls. Yes, dear Father, don't pass us by. Speak to our hearts. Bring conviction. Convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Father, we look to you for everything that we need. 
we can do nothing of ourselves. So give us humble hearts to give ourselves to you in a new and living way, a way that perhaps we have not taken before. If there's someone here this morning, Father, who has not given their heart to Jesus in a meaningful way, I pray that you will touch them very, very right now, very uh, strongly, that they would be able to say, yes, Lord, I give myself to you. And as we go into this new and uncertain week, I pray that your presence will go with us. Keep us safe. We've had some surgeries in this church this week, Lord. Help them to heal and be normal. And other people that need, need your help today. We think about those war-torn areas in Ukraine. People in the middle of the winter without food and without shelter. Father, look with favor upon your people. And even so come, Lord Jesus. And I pray in, your, in the name of Jesus, amen.